Welcome everyone to this second talk on Lewis Mumford's text, Technics and Civilization. This talk is specifically tackling chapters three and four, chapter three, the eotechnic phase, and chapter four, the paleotechnic phase. Now, beginning with chapter three, really what we're beginning from is the foundation which we found and uh, developed in the first talk, which is ultimately a foundation of history, of philosophy, and of technology, all bundled into one in the sense of a history of the philosophy of technology, and in a certain sense, more specifically, a philosophy of the history of technology and, and none of these things can be taken uh, you know in a simple sort of linear progressive sense where one fully takes the reins and and in that way we begin with the eotechnic phase in chapter three and this general idea of phases for Munford which are the three phases which I'll get to of eotechnic paleotechnic and neotechnic and we're beginning ultimately with uh, the philosophy of history and of the history of technology. So for Mumford, he, he states this quite plainly because there's certain ideas which are being thrown around in his day, which he disagrees with. He states plainly that man draws on previous cultures for technological development. There is a history of technological development. Civilization is not self-contained. And in that sense, civilizations are not self-contained. And in this way, the phases that we are, that I'm going to be talking about and that Mumford is talking about, eotechnic, paleotechnic, and neotechnic, the three phases of techniques, um, these all overlap. They all interpenetrate and they all merge into one another. This isn't some sort of very strict self-contained history where we can just pull something out and take it in a vacuum. For Mumford, this would be uh, incorrect. Things merge, things you know flow into one another, things influence one another, and man ultimately draws and stands on the shoulders of giants, as the saying goes, uh, on previous cultures for technological development. And in this way, each quote unquote new culture is simply fragments of old one old ones. There's there's a cultural syncretism uh, and in a way a cultural synthesis. And this is important for Mumford because one of the other writers and thinkers and philosophers who might also be thrown in um, as these these sort of pinnacle great figures of the history of technology uh, or of the perhaps cyclical or philosophical nature of history in this sense is Spengler. We might also think of Toynbee. But Spengler is one which Mumford sort of takes to court. And, and, and Mumford, in reading Spengler, you know, understands there's this Spenglerian analysis of technology uh, in which sense invention arises out of some sort of mystical soul or what we could maybe consider Kantian genius. Um, you know, the, the, the things sort of arise almost miraculously for Spengler. And in this sense, the cycles of each quote unquote new culture are almost self-contained for Spengler in Mumford's reading. Of Spengler. So whether or not uh, a Spenglerian scholar would understand that as the quote unquote correct reading of Spengler, who knows? But that's Mumford's albeit sort of Marxist, uh, Marxist sympathetic reading of Spengler. And for Mumford, the reality is that the seeds of invention were blown in from other cultures and these things sort of slowly build. And, you know, in this way, the myth of progress, which we'll get to, and the idea of like a linear history of technology becomes, you know, sort of uh, dampened in the grand sense of invention. And really what we're looking at is the, the fact that for Mumford, the machine has a long history. And once again, you know, the machine isn't the mechanics. So you have machine, you have, you know, you have, you have mechanization, where we can think of the empirical cogs, levers, workings of machines. But then you have machinization, which is that abstract machine layer, which itself is the history we're talking about, which really relates to the abstractions of efficiency, productivity, and things along these lines, which you know don't always point to an empirical invention or machine uh, in, the, in the material sense, but point to a, a, a mode of being, a machine way of being. You know, machine man is different to man. So, 
you know, this is when we're entering into the idea that, okay, the machine has a long history, which ultimately isn't uh, found in a vacuum of singular cultures. So what do we do with this history? And this is where Mumford says, well, we have three phases to this history, eotechnic, paleotechnic, and neotechnic, with chapter three focusing on the first phase, which is eotechnic. Once again, all these phases are overlapping uh, and interpenetrating. So there isn't, you know, like we can't suddenly go, right, it's now 1875, we're into the paleotechnic or neotechnic or whatever. Um, however, the eotechnic phase, which once again, we can't say, right, this is exactly when it starts, is for Mumford the dawn age of modern techniques. It's really where this history that we're talking about of the abstraction of machines begins. Now, what makes these phases, I guess, defined, if you say, well, if they're all interpenetrating and overlapping and touching on one another, then how in any sense can we really define them? And the way each phase is roughly defined is by its relationship to raw materials and modes of production. So it's really defined by the limitations of the historical context which it's found within. Okay, So of course, um, in the sense of the progression and acceleration of techniques and of modes of production, in that sense, the acceleration equally enters, in, enters us as, as, a, as a species into new possible relationships with raw materials okay so like as smelting and 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 mining advance we we can now enter into a relationship with you know more rare minerals which in itself advances the phase and enters us into new phases so each phase has for mumford a fairly clear uh, raw material basis and from those raw materials of course you have the modes of production which those raw materials limit us to and what these raw material, what's very interesting for Mumford is actually what the raw materials and the modes of production allow us to do is develop a symbolic analysis of the technical processes which the complexity of those materials and productive modes allows. All sounds very complicated, but ultimately what it means is in the eotechnic phase, due to the limitations of raw materials, we are limited to, for instance, a quill for writing, which is ultimately just a cut feather dipped into a probably a very early on a very basic pot with ink. And what this signifies symbolically is that ultimately it's an era of handiwork, it's an era of craft, but it's also an era of cheapness of material, of crudeness, and almost of spontaneity because, well, you, you, you don't craft a feather, you, you find it and it's grown in an organic manner. Now, whereas when you put this in relation in relation to something which would really be in the neotechnic phase or the later paleotechnic phase, something such as a steel pen, well, you see it's mechanical, it's repetitive, it's not simply made. And you can think of, um, I believe it's Leonard Red's eye pencil, where he talks about how, you know, when you look at something such as a quill, let's start with a quill, well, you uh, my understanding of developing and creating a quill, you you find a feather and you cut it in a certain sense, and then you 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 find some ink or something to write with, which could easily be a pigment a pigment uh, dug from the ground and then mixed with a certain medium, and then you dip that and you write it. Most people with a relative level of intelligence could probably develop a, a quill quite literally by themselves. Now. When we move through to say a pencil, well, all of a sudden you have not only you have the wood, you have the manufacturing of the wood, you have the cutting of the wood, you have the ability to cut it right down to size, and then of course you have the lead. Uh, someone has to, uh, fi you know, gather the lead and then refine it down to the the thin cylindrical shape, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you have a rubber on the end, someone has to manufacture that. And then as you go through to something such as a steel pen, you have forging, you have mining, you have smelting, etc. You have all these interlocking com components which develop into a complex relationship, which ultimately then allow us to abstractly uh, develop a symbolic relationship with what the technical processes and the raw materials and the modes of production sort of limit or restrain or expand our relationship with that phase into. Um, and so for eotechnic, really what we're talking about for Mumford is the eotechnic phase is water and wood. Uh, it's a water and wood complex. The paleotechnic phase is coal and iron and the neotechnic is electric and alloy.
And ultimately what you can then see is that each of these phases then offloads its complex into history in the form of a sort of a reciprocal relationship we saw before. And so each phase has a history which itself is developed, but then the history itself is, is, is the technology in the history is then also looking back and developing itself. And so, sure, you're limited to water and wood, which in itself those limitations breed and bring about certain changes with respect to the technology that we have. What can we do with water and wood, basically? But then the technology which is developed equally then, uh, you know, looks back in a reciprocal relationship and influences the history and the development of history. So the relationship becomes reciprocal as it accelerates into the future. Whether or not you can consider this progress linear, I mean, that has to be in relation to a higher qualitative value. Now, Obviously, with these things, these phases don't come to sudden ends. They, as I've said, they blend into the next phase. There isn't this sudden point where we go, right, you know, we're using coal and iron now and everyone suddenly uses coal and iron. Different cultures, different tribes, different villages will have different advancements. And in a certain sense, you could say some places might be in a different phase than others. And equally, the fact of the matter is in a sort of John Michael Greer's sense or agrarian sense, if you were to read his book Retrotopia, you realize that the myth of progress is a myth by the fact that the eotechnic or the paleotechnic phase may still be here in certain things we use, and actually we could end up back into them, not in a sense of an archaic relationship of, oh, we've gone back in time, but simply we are now re-limited to the raw materials of those phases. It's not linear, it's not, it's not uh, you know, we haven't gone backwards in the sense of progression, at least political progression. Um, now, what happens for Mumford in his, once again, his sort of socialist, uh, Marxist sympathetic leaning is machinics accelerate and in doing so, power, production and efficiency accelerate. Now, production and efficiency are part of that machinic worldview and that abstraction that we spoke about last uh, in the last talk, so I won't focus solely on that here, but the notion of power is an interesting one. So when we look back to the eotechnic, paleotechnic and neotechnic differences in relation to raw material, you realize that, well, with wood and water, the power to use these is pretty much in the hands of any individual who is competent or has a certain amount of strength and ingenuity about them. And as you move forward in relationships with the raw materials, well, ultimately the ability to manufacture, smelt, mine, um, build these with these certain materials has to be focused within the sense of uh, certain um, areas of, we could say, power or utilization of tools. You know, not everyone can have a, a smelting rig. And then as you go through to certainly the, the neotechnic phase, not everyone can have the manufacturing equipment to develop, for instance, a chipboard for a computer. And so for Mumford, the reading is that as machinics accelerate, power becomes, um, you know, uh, pigeonholed or refined or, or restrained within certain places which perhaps have the currency and the money and the means to to basically have this equipment. And so the beginning of the eotechnic phase is the beginning of the move away from human power to horsepower to tools and to the abstraction of machinization and therefrom and from that from the from the move with that abstraction that abstraction becoming solidified within the hands of a few people. You know, as you move from the eotechnic phase to the paleotechnic phase in the need for more energy, well, no longer is it that the case that a human is, for instance, swinging an axe down on some lumber. It's now the case that in the, in the sense that everyone now needs coal, it's the sense of a mass of humans almost in a machinic way, you know, repetitively mining coal, which is then used in bulk to just in the in the manner of efficiency and then eventually you go well we need more power we need more energy so you might move through to horsepower to steam power to electricity etc and the 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 energy and the the move from human power to an abstract form of power in the sense of you're giving over the relationship to the actual abstraction itself begins to accelerate <laughs> 
And then in this sense, once again, what we're looking at is the Virilio idea of you invent the car, you invent the car crash, or with Mumford, you invent the gun, you invent the armor, which has to then stop a bullet. Um, for instance, we can think, well, okay, we now suddenly need more power, so we begin to use horses. Well, now we're using horses, so we need to feed horses, we need to house horses, and we need to develop now this whole other system um, to to basically cater to the abstraction itself. And so horses become part of the complexity, and then there's an increased need for agriculture because there's an increased need for food, and energy begets, begets energy, power begets power, machines beget machines, and it's a reciprocal relationship of acceleration in relation to the history in relation to the energy in relation to technology technology basically begets itself once it gets going and once we forget about the values which are needed in terms of an end and not simply just a means in the allulian sense means beget means beget means and we lose sight of the end um, with the eotechnic phase wind and water were basically the greatest areas of um power. Um, but as phases move forward in time, and once again, as energy begets energy, and once the abstraction takes over, technology accelerates the actual labor um, itself, you know, so technology is saying, well, how can we, how can we make this, you know, quote unquote, more technological? How can we make this more energy efficient? And once, once again, when we look back to the clock, um, we realize that what's happening is time saving. Okay. So, as technology accelerates, what we what begins to happen is the abstraction is just, as I've said, taking over. So labor becomes quite literally, well, it's a labor force. You know, it's no longer humans. It's a labor force. And, you know, we, we now have like time saving. Um, so when we think about the eotechnic phase, however, in relation to this, what we see is, well, with, with wind, water and wood, <laughs> we are, the raw material limitations are limited to, well, wind. We don't really control the wind at all, unless you want to stand around with a fan, in which case, once again, you still have the relationship with human power. But anyway, you don't control the wind. The streams run uh, as the streams run and wood grows very slowly. It's a seasonal and organically dependent energy system. So there is a relationship with nature, there's a relationship with the greater seasonal change, and the abstraction hasn't fully taken over in the eotechnic phase because we're still beholden to something larger. But when the industrial power begins to move forward and we suddenly need all this more, all, all, all more, all, all, all the more energy um, because we need to maintain the technological systems which have become more complex, Horses, steam engines, engines in general, etc. Um, the power balance becomes sort of unmaintained, and almost in a certain abstract sense, the machine is looking for ways to, in a, in, in a very strange way, artificially create energy from these systems. Okay, so you know the 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 simplicity of windmills and water mills, which were long lasting, um, all of a sudden this complexity grows, and you're entering into a fragile relationship with energy systems which are demanding more and more energy and trying to draw energy from the organic limitations that we have, uh, but for whose sake is what we, you know, in a certain sense, um, asking. Equally with the eotechnic phase, once again, lurking back to this reliance on the limitations and raw materials and this symbolic relationship, which Munford is really trying to look at in, in, in this chapter, we can say, well, okay, you know, the quill, as we've seen, allows us a symbolic represent uh, relationship with the raw materials. We can see what we can do with them. We can see how that would affect society. And then it changes perhaps to the steel pen and we could see how that would change society. But equally, Mumford says, well, okay, well, when we're reliant on wood, wind, um, streams, water, we have a relationship with these um, elements in the sense that they have, have have come from an organic background. And so you have the folklore, you have the mystery of the forest, you have the mystery of na nature as a foundation, uh, almost a spiritual foundation, or at least a natural foundation of an understanding of where, where things come from, um, you know, uh, and, and, and a, a deeper, uh, a depth of history with these things. This all sounds very simplistic, but of course, when you go through to perhaps the, the later raw materials which are used in the paleotechnic and definitely in the neotechnic phase, you are separated because of 
division of labor is a big uh, a big example but specialization and the, the fact that everyone is doing a very specific job and they don't have connection to the whole all of a sudden you don't really have a connection to the things themselves and all these materials are just a means once again but what they are means for well we we, we no longer really have an answer for that now in as we're focusing on the eotechnic phase one thing mumford uh, emphasizes that everything was made of wood like quite literally everything now with the limitations of these materials you end up of course constrained you go well you know we still need to do transportation we still need to do all the things that we want to do as human beings but you have wind water and wood and so what develops from these you know mumford is saying you, you take the raw material limitations that you have and this is how technology is built but then that reciprocal relationship once again begins and so you have ships and you have sailing because you have wind water and wood and so Ultimately, you're limited now to these materials, which means you're limited to the the ingenuity which can come from this limitation, which is ships and sailing. And what this really means is that by the 1500s, sailing uh, is, is the most advanced tech and long voyages become possible. Canals become the vital routes of transportation. And you can see from just the bare basics of the limitations of the raw, raw materials, which we, we which we are, you know, I keep saying it, limited to other factors in society, in the geography, uh, in, the, in the globe, in the way that we have a relationship with, with each other as humans, become of vital impor importance. So canals, for instance, well, what does a canal also symbolize? A canal also symbolizes, you know, we are beholden to nature. It's a very slow way of doing things. And we're also, you know, we, we're in the elements. We, we have an understanding of the elements. Um, in this sense, Mumford basically understands the eotechnic phase as a very, very, uh, very much a maritime one. Um, but this acceleration, you know, ultimately you accelerate any technology um, into that realm of efficiency and productivity. Um, and it also falls prey to tech values and then begins to justify just more transport and production, etc. Um, and in this way, uh, one, one strangely... Uh, to to sort of Mumford brings this invention and this this development in as a very clear example of how uh, the a small uh, well what seems small at the time I guess alteration in the limits of the raw materials we um, have access to actually overhauls social values and so the need for glass as in window panes and glasses, um, is brought about and we begin to develop glass. Now, it, of course, to us now, this seems like the most obvious thing that you'd ever need. Um, now, what changes this raw material or this small development, seemingly small development, brings about are sort of almost unfathomable. You know, at first, glass is this extremely um, precious thing actually glass was so precious that windows were actually removed at uh, at night and um you know placed somewhere else and wooden uh, wooden boards were put in place because it was just that precious now glass doesn't seem like it would change all that much but actually all of a sudden dwelling places uh, allow light into them um lengthening the working day and so you know you have wood you have water you have wind, and as my understanding of developing glass, I believe you have uh, sand or some smelt basic smelting equipment. Um, as the eotechnic phase is slowly blending into the paleotechnic phase, and you you now have glass, and so you now have windows on the places of work and houses, and all of a sudden, the 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 working day is lengthened basically from when the sun is out, when light um, comes in. But this means spectacles are invented and telescope, and all of a sudden you have symbolically you now have this relationship simply fact to uh, simply of the fact of the raw material of uh, of glass or the developed material of glass, um, the symbolic relationship with the material and the time and the philosophy and the technology changes because what glass really brings about symbolically is clarity. But in the fact that you just begin to develop telescopes, you have clarity and infinity. This is what glass brings about for Mumford in the history and the philosophy of technology. It also brings about basically the progress of scientific development because you have test tubes, you have sealing, you know, as in sealants, you have the beginning of the laboratory. But one of the very strange effects of glass is glass is something which it's 
the, 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 in its very essence, it has to be clean. It has to be clear. And actually, the beginning of glass is really the beginnings of the history of hygiene. Um, you begin to have this relationship with people about, you know, cleanliness. Um, and and this has reciprocal and uh, effects over the entirety of society, basically, as glass becomes more prevalent. Once again, a small technological change having these um, rippling effects out into the, the, the social whole. But equally with this, one of the other stranger effects of glass is actually it's the beginning of, in a certain sense, very common ego because you now have an accessible mirror where one of the common mirrors before, well, who knows, maybe a pool of water or something of these sorts. But before this, mirrors, this is Mumford's uh, history, so <laughs> and he, he doesn't necessarily go into massive details or, or footnotes or, or references, etc. But this is the beginnings of basically an accessible mirror for most people. And so the the strange thing of having an accessible mirror is that you now have a reflection of reality and you move a little bit more away from myth because in the sense of a mirror, you have this symbolic effect of mirroring. But alongside this, you now have all these things coming into view because of one simple invention of glass. You have the telescope, so we're suddenly looking out into you know, space, we're looking out into infinity, so we're sort of, we're removed in that sort of Copernican revolution sense as the centre of the universe, you know, look how big everything else is, but also glass allows us to look deeper inwards, and so we're removed almost in a sense of ungrounding because of one simple uh, technological invention. So for Mumford, there's many of these inventions which have these really big rippling effects. But the primary inventions between 1000 AD and 1750 AD are clocks, because, of course, timekeeping and the division of time. And then literally clocks also are, you know, the, 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 the harbingers of division in general. Clocks, telescopes, paper, printing press, magnetic compass, and glass would also be another one. And from these, basically, the symbolic relationship of regulation, efficiency, idea spreading via printing press, uh, navigation, and a very sort of linear, strict, numeric, mathematical, abstract, machinic worldview uh, is, is implicated by this history of technology. Now, another odd thing that's happening with technology on a social level is actually invention, as we said in the last talk, invention sort of uh, goes a bit mad. Everyone, you know, invention in this time is crazy. Everyone's mad about invention. And one reason for this is that invention is it becomes a means of escaping one's class in the years where, you know, 1000 to 1750 and before. This is These are eras when class is a big deal you know, feudalism, aristocracy, lords, ladies, paupers, peasants, uh, inventions um, in an era when new inventions are coming, you know, thick and fast, and they're very, very quick to be monopolized, inventions began to basically threaten class lines. Now, this is a Marxist reading, but, you know, whether or not you take Mumford on it is up to you. Um, now, th so... It's upsetting, No, you know, basically Mumford's point with this at this juncture is that the history of technology isn't this simplistic materialistic history. Uh, you know, it's upsetting, you know, it, well, not necessarily upsetting, but it's overhauling uh, the history of society in the sense of, well, hygiene comes about because of one simple invention, navigation, um, ideas begin to be, to be spread. Um, you know, a simple invention can basically destabilize the entire class structure of somewhere. And also certain inventions as time goes on, trains, for instance, bring about the idea of, you know, separate worlds, which you can suddenly move to all of a, all of a sudden the world becomes sort of smaller, but also we become bigger in space. Um, automation, uh, you know, becomes a thing because the train is almost like running itself. And, you know, this is what's happening with invention, basically. It's a very sort of seemingly surprisingly simplistic analysis, but Mumford's point is that you almost, you know, one single invention, technologically speaking, is like a drop into a pool, and those ripple outwards and have equally their own uh, effects, whether or not they're negative or positive. Mumford is really quite, actually quite unbiased on that, unless it comes to certain Marxist elements, you know, class, etc. But in terms of his, uh, the, as I understand it, the dialectical historical reading of history, uh, 
he doesn't lean on that too hard, really. Um, but basically, the invention, which is um, there's there's two inventions which you could really really say are the 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 ultimate, the the dual ultimate of moving and pushing the eotechnic phase forward very very fast. So clocks, which became universal very very quickly, um, you know, time. Precision, labor, efficiency, production. The qualitative relationship of man to material is removed in the sense of labor because as soon as you have time, you have an understanding of productivity and you have an understanding of who is doing what and how much is getting done. Whether or not this is negative and pos or positive, actually Mumford is sort of fairly um, relaxed in whether or not he says yes or no. But ultimately you can see the ripples of the clock and the ripples of linear time uh, are massive. And then secondly, cheap paper and print. Not only does it save space, time and labor, but thought becomes abstract. Everything begins to be recorded and you have basically uh, the beginning of, in a certain sense, accountancy in a very abstract way. But from these two things, and especially paper, and especially now we also have glass and the notion of cleanliness and the notion of study, the scientific academy, as it sort of now would be known, is founded in the 1500s. Once again, the eotechnic phase is is pretty pretty long, and it's also very merging with other things. Uh, in relation to this notion of invention, industrial exhibitions um, become to be prevalent because invention is such a huge thing. You know, we we now enter into this age of you know really trying to push things forward. The the, the abstract idea of the machine is sort of taken over at this point. And what happens? Factories are invented, growing out of um, basically industrial processes. Now, there are, they, the factories are, are of huge importance. One great book on factories is um, Ralph Borsodi's uh, the, This Ugly Civilization. He talks about factories with no end in that book, and it's absolutely fantastic. But Mumford, once again, has this peculiar uh, emphasis on certain things which are happening within these technological advancements. And he says, well, okay, you know, factories invented, it seems quite straightforward, but there's a twofold, in import there's twofold importance of factories for Mumford. One, they're now a social meeting place. And two, they are the clear advancement of capitalism. That's, you know, these two sort of strange ripples that you wouldn't really focus on. Mumford is saying, look, these are the clear elements. All of a sudden, you're moved away perhaps from that familial dynamic or the small handicraft dynamic of homesteading, of small um, handiwork places to, you know, the factory. And of course, in time, we all now understand, you know, with Fordism, with the division of labor, with the hyper division of labor and specialization, factories turn people basically into machines as the, the great cliche going, the great cliche goes, which advances capitalism. Mumford's reading once again. Now, also one of the things for factories, they need cleaning, they need lubricating, they need checking, uh, they need that regulation. And so now the factory's built, well, you have everything that comes with a factory that you, you sort of overlook. You know, technology begets more technology because technology needs technology to continue its technological thing, which sounds ridiculous in a tautology, but technolo technology relies on basically what it would consider to be like a self-justifying tautology of its own existence to just keep going. Um, now, when we look back to the eotechnic reliance on wind, sun, water, uh, etc., and wood, we see there is that energy was irregular. As we move forward in time, the division of labor, the reliance on coal, etc., what is solidified is the regularity of energy. But with the regularity of energy, you know, once you need, once you have regular energy, well, now you need regular energy because the entirety of society is now reliant on that regular energy. So, uh, you know, the, once again, the machine begets the machine. Um, human labor, as it enters into the factory, basically becomes more mechanic. Uh, machines take on human likeness and humans take on machine likeness. OK, so it's no longer the human arm with its organic limitations. You know, it's machines which are doing the work and humans are sort of a counterpart cog to the machine. This is all very uh, basic cliche stuff <laughs> in the philosophy of technology. Um but everything, as, as, as of no surprise, becomes more specialized, becomes more machinic. Um, now, um, and that's, in a certain sense, that's where the eotechnic phases end, is really with the, 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 the 
the look to the factory, you could say. It's not sort of solidified in the eotechnic phase because when we move into chapter four, we begin with the paleotechnic phase. We are looking at the mid 18th century. We are looking at the industrial revolution, but not the beginnings because, you know, who's going to draw that line? But ultimately, for Mumford, paleotechnic phase begins mid 18th century. The industrial revolution is well underway. What's underway then? A time of systematization, of complexity, of increasing complexity, of acceleration, and of basically efficiency, productivity. You know, the machinic, the machinic has really solidified itself as almost like the value of society for its own sake. So once again, we move, have that move as this progression goes forward from life values to the values of the machine. It's, in a sense, the move from a qualitative relationship to a quantitative relationship. We're now in the era of complete quantification, and we can look back to the certain inventions and the certain limitations of, once again, raw materials and inventions to see how this comes about, because you can't have complete quantification without clocks, without paper, and also, you know, without the smaller things which we overlook, such as glass. Um and because of this quantification, uh, there's major changes. Now, Mumford actually begins in England because he basically says, look, the history of the Industrial Revolution is really a history of what's going on in England at the time. Um, you have canals, you have factories, you have horticulture, you know, big, aggressive forms of industrialization and complex networks, which are all interconnecting. Work and industry becomes an end in itself. Everything is sort of must become a fortune. It's like the era of fortune, but actually it's. And this is Mumford's reading, and I don't fully agree with it, to be honest. You could go read someone like Greer or read maybe a first-hand account of the time and see that Mumford is a pretty biased at this point, I would say. But Mumford basically says, look, towns become work towns. You know, people lived and died within sight of the coal mine or quarry. They were working 14 to 16 hour days. Um, poverty became basically a chain, right? Due to low wages, you were just Mumford's reading. You were just living to exist in the sense of you just, you, you know, you, you were born, you worked in a mine, you died young, and then your family inherited your poverty. There wasn't really a sense of handing down any money. Um, in 1851, Mumford says there's a uh, palace, an e sorry, an exhibition at Crystal Palace, and it's like the height of triumph of this era. You know, it's the it's the absolute exhibition of free trade, enterprise, invention. Um, now, what the era we're really talking about is from 1700 to 1870, and then there's sort of through. So 1700 to 1870 is like the upward slope if you wanted to to put a peak on this and then 1873 to 1900 is is like an acceleration but a downward acceleration if that makes any sense um it's you know 18 eight, so for Mumford it's about 800 years you know 1000 AD through to roughly 1800 AD for eotechnic and then it's shorter for paleo and then in a certain sense it's quite strange to say well you know shorter and shorter and shorter phases because the the, the limitations of the raw material uh are you know, you, you, you're all, acceleration is acceleration of acceleration. It sounds silly, once again. Um, but what's happening is the same relationship with uh, the acceleration of the limitations and the relationships with the raw materials is happening in a faster sense. So coal turns to steam, so you have an increase of energy. Um, so coal turns to steam engines, which in turns, you know, that's then new accelerated methods of smelting. And then you begin to smelt iron. So then you have coal, iron and steam, etc. And so you also have all the limitations which coal brings about. So, okay, we need now, we now need um, transportation for coal, but you also have everything which coal brings about, which basically we've forgotten in the history of society, which was everything was gray and grim and black and, and fairly, um, and of course you have all the health implications of this. You have the symbolic relationship with coal and it begins to be a catch all replacement for basically all the energy sources. And so you see a dying off of wood, sperm oil, tallow, wax, um, and in, in that you can see that you begin to avoid the seasonal influence and the abstract artificial influence of just this like almost seemingly eternal machinic energy source comes in and from this abundance of new energy from coal the 19th century becomes one of rushes for Mumford what do I mean by that? gold rush, iron rush, diamond rush basically you suddenly have a simple exhaustion of goods Okay, people go places, they exhaust it in sort of an, ex uh, an abundance of energy and they move on 
It's the era, uh, the beginning of the era of exploitation for quick gains. Okay, it's the machinic abundance of energy and you just burn through it, you move on, you burn through it, you move on. Of course, from this, everything uh, has at all times is always advancing. So new machines needed more fuel because they're now more advanced, increasing the general exploitation of everything for quick gains because, you know, the machine needs the machine needs the machine. Um, and, you know, think about it in terms of the 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 power restrictions wind and water were free coal is expensive at the beginning and therefore it's the beginning of a monopoly power becomes once again restricted into the hands of few because you can't just go out and mine coal for yourself um railroads begin to extend even further bringing with them you know the technologies and the methods that are needed for them um and then from this, you know, abundance of this new energy and then the technology which it brings about, which is iron smelting, everything begins as everything was made of wood in the time before with all the symbolic connotations of wood. Now everything is made of iron with all the connotations of iron, you know, beds, bowls, even billiards tables were made of iron. But ultimately, what does iron need? It needs continual maintenance. It needs lubrication. It's also like glass in the sense that it needs cleaning. Um, it's falls prey to oxidization. Things begin to rust. Okay, So now we enter into an era of maintenance, which often may have to be um, offloaded to a third party who knows more about it. You know, the era of specialization and division of labor and you know, of this sort of fragmentation into quantity really begins to pick up steam, no pun intended, here. So Mumford ironically says that technology between 1775 and 1875 was what we would consider generally very forwards, but actually it's very backwards in the sense that you still have entropic um, factors for it in the sense that, well, you know, iron's going to rust and this, you know, oh great, we have this abundance of coal and coal energy. But, you know, look at the paintings of William Turner, who Mumford cites, you know, there's all this soot and black and dust and etc. Air pollution begins with paleotechnic civilization. Um, steam engines were actually only 10% efficient. So you sort of, it's an era of absolute exhaustion um, and, and exploitation of the raw materials which were afforded. Nature, in this sense, basically begins to be understood as an abstraction. It's something to be dominated. Uh, water becomes unfit for drinking in many places. Um, typhoid, uh, you know, many, many people, when they think back to this era, you know, in their school history classes, understand it as the era of rife with diseases because of, you know, we've treated nature in this sense. We're just dumping stuff into nature. Handy workers are, of course, now competing with the machines. We see this in the in with Ned Ludd and the Luddite revolution and the smashing of the looms. You know that they, 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 they this was their understanding that what that it wasn't it wasn't simply I would say it wasn't simply a a loss of jobs. It was a smashing of the quantity for the sake of quality. Skills are being lost due to the hyperdivision and what we could say like a proto-Fordism uh, because everything needs to be efficient and productive. Uh, there is, thanks to this, an increase in the population. Um, many people were actually, and once again, this is Mumford's sort of, you know, this is where we really would need a little, little bit more footnoted research. But for Mumford, many people were reduced to apathy due to long hours and the repetitive nature of factories. Once again, man becomes the machine. Um, it's overwork, it's exhaustion, alcohol becomes the common escape from the drudgery. Um, there's an odd section where Mumford focuses on the fact that sex was cold and was without knowledge of stimulation and homes were overcrowded. And so really the, the sexual relationships between people also just get stifled out by the machine. And ultimately what overtakes everything is the myth of progress, you know, the doctrine of progress. Everything needs to be cleaner. It needs to be more humane in that humanistic secular sense. Uh, it needs to be better, faster, more efficient, more productive. Um, but what's forgotten in all of this is the people who are within the myth of progress itself. Um, but also what happens here is the population um, overtakes the food supply. There's a general struggle for existence. And for Marxists, this is the beginning of a clear class struggle. And there ultimately is at this juncture, at the end of chapter four, this vision of industrialized excess, acceleration for its own sake, and also the lack of a plan. Everything is because we can just do it, but it seems to be that everything is being done in the name of the machine for the sake of the machine itself. And that's really where the paleotechnic phase 
um, or well, at least the chapter four, where you begin to see the merging into the neotechnic phase ends, is like an era of excess where all the technology for itself has advanced to the, to, you know, to this reaching for the stars, so to speak, but it's leaving behind all the humans. And this is really what Mumford means by the fact that, well, the technology was very forward, but actually it was completely backwards at the same time. And this is where we're left uh, at the end of chapter four. Um, but, you know, Eotechnic and Paleotechnic have very clear relationships. Uh, they merge very, m much more clearly into one another. Um, so, um, yeah, that's and that's where we're at. It's sort of a, in a way, it's a bleak picture. I think Mumford is a little bit biased, to be honest, um, about his sympathies. So it's strange because he seems to have those earlier sympathies for the Eotechnic phase, but then also sympathies for man and for almost like a future a certain form of holistic futurism so he's very be between things he's very much a man of value and a man of what are the principles which you're actually working towards uh you know throughout all of this anyway i hope you've uh, all enjoyed this second part of these talks and the next two parts um which will be on the neotechnic and then on you know what Munford sort of where he sees us all going uh, the next two parts will be for patrons only so please find links to the patreon um in the description below um and yeah thank you all for listening and see you all in the next part